Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are in Joel chapter 2, uh, looking at verses 17 through 27. This is going to be the uh, Joel 2, 17 through 27. This is going to be the material blessing or the physical blessing that is going to be an indication of the Lord's uh, return to His people, of blessing His people, of them being brought back into fellowship after their lamentation of, uh, of crying out to the Lord that was recorded and suggested by Joel. Uh, next, after these verses, beginning verse 28, there's going to be the spiritual or the supernatural restoration. We're going to talk about the Spirit being poured out on all people, which again we are familiar with that from the book of Acts, talking about uh, an, almost an eschatological verse. So we have several things still taking place in this. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about Joel's day. We're talking about a physical destruction of the land and a physical restoration of the land. But it all hinges on the people's relationship with God, uh, of them being away from God or in rebellion, and then being brought back to God. And now being brought back to God, it is going to be uh, a salvation. These verses are about salvation. They're about deliverance. And again, it's got a twofold representation. It's going to be they're coming back into fellowship with God. God is accepting them back, calling them His people again. There's going to be a physical manifestation. The land that was destroyed is going to be restored. And so there is a very clear, and that's what we're going to see, is a, the restoration of the physical land. But there's also going to be uh, a spiritual deliverance uh, that's going to include them being brought back to God and never going to go away from Him again, which again has an eschatological sound to it, like a final result. But as we talked last week, it, it is also including some, possibly, especially with the reference to the northerner and Mount Zephon, of a, a spiritual connection uh, uh, in the sense of demonic realm. The, the invasion could be, again, uh, the locust or that second invasion that is in chapter 2 that we're looking at could be an eschatological invasion from revelation of, of the, the Nephilim, the demons that are released out of Hades, out of the abyss. Uh, and so there's all that that needs to be considered. So we're clearly looking at a, a material a restoration of Israel, probably in Joel's day that's taking place, although the destruction that we see in chapter 1 was the locusts, uh, a famine, uh, the burning of the land, and, and then the, the trees are stripped. The bark appears to be gone. Clearly the vines of the vineyard are destroyed. So it's, it can't be a, a quick restoration. Even in a, the natural realm, it's going to take years for the land to recover from the the fires, the trees being devoured, the, the vineyards being destroyed. I mean, we're talking about trees having to grow again, reproduce the figs. So uh, the turnaround time has to be at least several years of, for this to take place. But then besides just being a Joel's day, there is that overtone of uh, something in the future, especially when we see absolutes like never again. Now, in chapter 2, uh, we, we saw the talk about in verses 2 through uh, 9, the coming, or 2 through uh, 11, the coming of the invasion. Again, is that a re re restatement of the locust invasion? I tend to think it's a, a military invasion, uh, which definitely would be some kind of human army. But then as we looked at last week, there could be, especially when you look at the northerner, that opens up a whole category of uh, Mount Zephon and all the gods of the Canaanite religion, which is basically uh, just a, a, a collection of all of the, the, the Nephilim or the foreign gods that ruled before the flood and after the flood, going back and forth from the underworld. And it's not out of the context of the scriptures, uh, especially when you see those references to those gods uh, in different places. Again, they are not gods, although they are referred to as gods. They are demonic beings, and that's well supported in Scripture. Uh, so, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that. And so, that that army could be a rehashing of the locusts. Uh, it could be a military invasion, or it could be 
uh, uprising of spiritual beings, especially in the end times, especially when you read Revelation about the abyss being open and locusts coming up from the abyss. It could be a connection to this very event, and it would include uh, physical armies and supernatural demonic manifestations in those armies, uh, especially in the last days. And you remember how uh, the demons, like frogs, went out and gathered the kings for battle, and then there's going to be the invasion of the land of Israel. Well, nonetheless, that is taking place, and then in chapter 2, verse 12, uh, Joel gives them clear instructions to uh, repent. And I'll read that very quickly, chapter 2, verse 12. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. This would be Joel in his day giving advice to the people. This is how you've got to, uh, got to return. This is what you have to do. They saw the disaster of the land as an act of God. So the, if there's no rain, if there's a locust invasion, if there's fires breaking out, it is God that's allowing it to happen or causing it to happen, especially when you see him leading the army. He's leading the army against his people. It says it a couple times in this book. And so if there's a direct connection or not, they're going to go to God and repent. That's Joel's advice. And so they do. In verse 14 it says, Who knows, he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offering and drink offerings from the Lord your God. Then verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call an assembly, and everyone is to gather in the temple, all people, the, the elders, the, the people, the groom, the bride, the infants, the children, everyone is to come. The priests are to go before the Lord and begin to uh, do their job of, of fasting and weeping and praying between the, the, the entrance to the temple, the portico, and the altar. And, and it even says in verse 17, what the priests are supposed to say. Let them say, spare your people, O Yahweh. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Now that, word, that line is important tonight. A, a byword among the nations or to be mocked among the nations. The nations are watching this. Uh, and if you go to the idea that the nations are invading Israel, that even the, the rulers and authorities uh, the demonic forces are invading Israel and destroying Israel, which would indicate they are defeating Yahweh. Again, we talked last week, we ended with kind of the, the talk about Ephesians 6, or at least mentioning it. Uh, if God says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities in heavenly places, well then surely God's battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities. It says put on the armor of God, so that you can take your stand against evil in, in that day. And our battle is against the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. We're not putting on the armor of God to fight the flesh, I mean, the, like other people. And surely the armor of God that we're to put on is not being worn by God to fight against people. Jesus came to the earth to save people. His battle is, is also against rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So when we see this all taking place, uh, we've got to at least consider the fact, and I think maybe be very open to the fact, that this is demonic forces coming in and destroying God's people in an attempt to destroy Yahweh and His claim itself. That's the, that goes way back to Satan's rebellion, the fall in the Garden of Eden, the Nephilim before the flood, all the way through history is demonic forces trying to take out God's purpose um, and God Himself. So when God comes to fight, God comes to deliver, uh, He's going to deliver His people, which is an indication of His victory over the rulers and authorities in other places. And it's not like He's waiting, it's not like God's plan is waiting for mankind to rise up and be obedient. Because if God's plan is hinged on man's obedience, then it's going to fail. So God knows that His plan involves humans, it involves His people, especially Israel, but He also knows throughout Scripture that He's going to have to come and be the one that delivers them from themselves. Thus, Jesus on the cross, Jesus paying for the sins of the world, and now we are in Christ, and now in Christ's strength we can rise up and be the people God's called us to be. We can have, like He talks about, a new heart, a new nature, the promise of Jeremiah, the, the new covenant. And it's going to be God 
he's showing himself strong in his people, but if he's waiting for his people to rise up and prove that he's right, he's going to lose. So he's got to become some, something within his people himself, like a Messiah, to make his people strong, to make his people righteous, so that he can show himself strong. And that's what you see right here. This line in verse 17, Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations, or if you go to the English Standard Version, a byword amongst the, the, the peoples, the, the Gentiles. And with that being said, uh, and it goes on and says, Why should they, I mean, on, on, well, I'm mean, still in verse 17, why should they say among the peoples, among the nations, where is their God? Or to the Israelites, where is Yahweh? As, as the people of Israel, or God's people, are being trampled by the enemy. Once again, realize God is allowing his people to be trampled because, and the locust invasion come, because they've been disobedient. And also realize he's the one, it says a couple of times, that he is leading this military. He's gone up and got them to bring them against his people. Even Ezekiel says he's going to put a hook in the jaw and drag them down in the battle into the mountains of Israel to go to war. So God is, and we can see he did that with the Babylonians, he did that with the Assyrians, brought them against his own people to discipline them so they would cry out to help for him so that he could show himself strong. And that's what we see right here. Why should they say among the people, where is, where is their God? Now, as we said a couple of weeks ago, beginning in verse 18, uh, we've got the Lord's response, which I believe is uh, the Lord's word, a prophetic word, an oracle to Joel, as surely as he says, this is what you should do, go to the Temple Mount, say these words, pray. They must have done those things. And now through Joel is going to come this word of the Lord's response. And it is a positive response. The Lord is going to deliver his people. So I'll read it very quickly in the NIV. Then the Lord will be jealous for his people and take pity on his people. And again, one of the themes here and throughout these verses is the ideal of his people. He's now, he's no longer judging the people. He's now calling them his people, meaning we're back in fellowship. We're back on the same page. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. And this is going to be now a statement of reversal of all the things the locusts have done. God is going to reverse it. An absolute statement here that is concerning as we read this, never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. In other words, they're, they're saying, why should we be mocked by the nations? Because when we go down, it's like you failed because you made a promise that you were going to deliver us and, and we failed and what are you going to do about it? Well, God's going to come and deliver them. And he says, No longer, never again, will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northerner far from you, or the northern army, depending on your translations, which is, again, that word Zaphon, which is the northern mountain. Uh, and we talked about that last week up in Ugarit on the, in the Israel, or, uh, Syrian and, and uh, uh, Turkey border today. Uh, I will drive the northern army far from you, or the northerner, pushing it into a parched and barren land with its front columns going into the eastern sea and those of the rear into the western sea. And a stench will come up, its smell will rise. And here's the, the final line of this right here. Surely he has done great things. And that great is the word, uh, it means great, uh, and it can be great evil it can be great good it's just make amazing great huge things but it's all in the context of who's doing it and in this case the word great and this is from the notes uh, from a couple weeks ago uh, he has done great things and who has done great things it's this northerner and we saw parallels with this with Gog coming down from the north and doing great things or terrible things amazingly wicked things in Israel and because of that is being destroyed and the, the, the carcasses of the army causes a stench and I think very clearly that re reference to and again like we said a couple weeks ago the reference to the dead carcasses could be locusts being driven into the sea by the wind that would cause a smell there's historical record of that but biblically uh, whenever there's a reference to dead bodies and and 
uh, a, a defeat military and a stench, a stinking. It is the dead armies. It's, it's an indication of a dead army. So I still feel very strongly that this is a defeat of a military in the land of Israel's, uh, in the land of Israel. And again, if we put this where it's at here in Joel, around 360 as the beginning of the rising of the Greeks, at the end of the Old Testament, that means this military is not Assyrian and it's not Babylonian. It's, it's yet, and it, historically it wouldn't be the Greeks, and it's clearly not the Romans. It would be a, a future military. And again, one more time, in my, the defense of Joel being here instead of on the other side of the prophets is there's that the copying of the phrases. If, if Joel's on that side of Isaiah and Jeremiah, then all the prophets are looking back at this one prophet, Joel, and quoting him. But if Joel's on this side, Joel's looking back at the entire spectrum of Jewish prophets and using phrases and terminology and collecting them. So either he's the the originator of a lot of references and terminology and ideas of Jewish prophecy, or he's the one that inherited it from the others. And so I, I just feel very strongly. Now, I don't want to rehash this all again, but older commentaries in the 1800s, 1800s and stuff, early 1900s, they had put Joel up there in front of Isaiah. As they swung through the 1900s and into this century, Joel has moved over on this side, and I think for obvious reasons. And it's not a matter of becoming liberal or, or sloppy in their commentaries. It just seems to make sense. And that's, that's where I'm at when I look at this. Okay, so he has done great things, and that great is a word uh, that is in context, meaning evil things, great than evil. Now we begin our verses for tonight. Uh, if you look on page one of the notes... Uh, I've got right there a breakdown. It's the fourth bullet point down. A breakdown of these verses. It's in verse, chapter 2, verse 18 is an introduction to God's response. Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. Okay, that's what Joel says. And now begins the first oracle. The first oracle is verses 19 through 20. It, it's a prophecy. It's an oracle. What is God going to do? He's now speaking because you've repented in the temple as a nation. Uh, I am sending you grain, new wine and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern, northern, northern army far from you, pushing it into the parched land and barren land with its front columns going into the eastern sea and those of the rear into the western sea, and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things or very bad things. That is the end of that first oracle. And now begins verses 21 through 23. We'll come back and break those down. This is a now a, a, the people's response, the singing, the joy. And here it's, it's like this. Do not be afraid, O land, or the Lord is singing to the people. And there's three things that are addressed. The land, the animals, and the people in these verses. And again, it, it focuses on do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Verse 22. Do not be afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. So you've seen the, the land, now the animals. And verse 23. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. And that would end now the rejoicing or the singing or the command to the land, the animals, and the people. And I'll mention it now and probably again. If you go back to chapter 1 and into throughout that, that it goes in just reverse order. First, the people are warned, and they're hungry, and they're suffering. And then the animals are even mourning, and how suffer they can't find anything to eat. And then it talks about how terrible the land is. Even the land's on fire. That was chapter 1. So it went, the people are disobedient and being punished. The result, the animals are suffering because the people have rebelled. Even the land itself is barren and on fire because of the people. Here, he's now restoring the land. The land rejoices, restoring the animals, the animals rejoice, and as those things are recovering, now the people are being told, you can rejoice. And you see a direct connection here 
in these verses. You see it in Isaiah. You see it throughout the scripture. You see it in Romans. We talked about it last night again just in passing. But creation connected with humanity. When humanity follows God, creation is in a good state. If humanity rebels against God, creation falls into vanity. It began in the Garden of Eden. When man fell into sin, creation was put into a state of futility, of endless cycles. So there is a direct connection on humans' response to God and how their world responds. If humans are in rebellion, the earth goes into rebellion. They follow or into futility. And so it's very, 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 very interesting to me to see a progressive nation, a progressive culture who wants to be so wise and reject God, reject his reality, and then turn and save the planet. Do you understand this Bible, it teaches that when you rebel against God, your world unravels. The only way you're going to resolve the earth, the creative issues, is to come to God and meet the creator of reality for your reality to be restored. And we are, we are going in an attempt to save ourselves. We are running from God, and as we're running, it's like a ball of yarn just unraveling. And the further and the faster we run to save ourselves, and we're running against reality, the worse it, and we can't, we will not, we will not be able to figure it out. Thus, we're in the postmodern age where reality is broken, we can't find the answers, but the more we can't find the answers, the more we chase after vanity, coming up with idiotic answers, which lead to more destruction, and thinking to be wise, we're becoming more and more foolish, and our answers are doing more damage. It, it's, it's a self-defeating, it's like, the more we try to help ourselves in rebellion towards God, the worse we're making the situation. And then the wise are going to get together and come up with a great idea. They're, they're, they're going to come together. They're going to have a conference. Let's just reason together and come up with an answer. And whatever they throw out of their mouth is going to be stupider than it was when they came into the meeting. It's like just stop having meetings. Stop talking and just return to God and embrace the reality He created. Well, we don't want to go backwards. What? That's that, that that you're recovering. You are unraveling, and and you're never you're never going to convince them. You're, it's going to be the spirit of God. There's nothing you can do because in their conferences, in their meetings, in their wisdom, they're going to find who is really the source of this problem, and it's going to be people who are pointing towards God, saying, "Let's go back to reality. Let's go back to aha. We found the weak link. It's these people." You want a biblical example? You know the biblical example, Jeremiah. For 40 years, Jeremiah says, don't, 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 Babylon's coming. The people put him in prison. They blocked him up in stocks. They mocked him. They wouldn't let him preach in the Temple Mount. Finally, disaster comes. The city's all burnt. The people are all taken captive, taken away, except for a handful who stay back in, in the land, that were left in the land. And they say, we should go to Egypt. Jeremiah says, do not go to Egypt. They says, Jeremiah, we are so sorry. We didn't listen to you for 40 years. But now what we would like you to do is go ask God, should we go to Egypt or should we stay in the land? And whatever you say, this time we're going to listen. I says, okay. He went away, prayed for three days, came back and then says, the Lord says he's done with this land as far as destroying it. That Nebuchadnezzar has already come. Judgment has already come. Nebuchadnezzar is not coming back to Jerusalem. It's already burnt to the ground. So don't leave this land. Stay here. He'll protect you. He'll take care of you. And eventually he will restore the land. They say, Jeremiah, we know you're lying to us. We're going to Egypt. They take him down to Egypt. And they say in Egypt, the reason all those problems happened to the land was because of Josiah and Jeremiah and all those people leading us away from, trying to lead us away from the worship of the idols like Asherah and, 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 and the Asherah pole that they had. Uh, and and, and uh, oh, uh, Baal, Baal. It would be uh, not not just Baal. Oh, okay. I'm thinking of uh, Tammuz, Tammuz, and the cakes they make for Asherah. And they says it was when we stopped. We would say it this way: It's when we stopped being progressive 
that's when all these bad things started to happen. Well, no, it was they'd been progressives for so long that all these bad things were happening. And Jeremiah says, stop, stop, stop. And the king came in, Josiah says, we're going to stop doing this. We're going to try to recover. But the people kept going. They would not repent. They kept going, and they led to their destruction. But in the end, whose fault was it? Jeremiah, Josiah, and all those people that were pointing at God. The problem was actually the, the wickedness, the, the false religion, the false reality, but they blamed reality for it. And so don't expect anything different in your culture. But nonetheless, coming back to our text, um, it says uh, uh, the, two, the two oracles. The first oracle is chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. that ends with the northerner. And then the songs of joy encouraging the people. Uh, do not fear. The land's going to be restored. The animals are going to be restored. The people are going to be restored. And then we come to the final prophecy or oracle. Talk about what God is going to do. And that's verses 24 through 27. The threat, this is him just saying what he's going to do. And it is entirely material. Okay, it's entirely material. It is God, because the people have come back, God is bringing their creation back to them. So because they were in rebellion, God tore, burned it down. Now they've come back, God says, okay, I'm going to restore your creation. It's all material. There's nothing wrong. There's no, that's not the prosperity gospel. That's the way it works. Man falls in the garden. Creation goes into vanity. In this case, the people rebel against God. The locusts come. Famine comes. The people come back to God. This creation is restored. It's Romans chapter 8. Creation is waiting for the sons of God to be manifested so we can get back to reality. So here it is in chapter uh, 2, verse 24, the second part of the restoration promise or the oracle. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm. Here it is, watch this. My great army that I sent among you. There's God even during the restoration saying, it was my great army that I sent against you to destroy the land I'm now going to restore. I mean, he's not even, people are going to try to duck that and explain that, but God is saying, I brought the enemy to destroy you, and now that you've come back, I'm going to drive the enemy away and restore you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who, you, who has worked wonders for you. Never again, there is again an absolute, will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. And here it is for the second time. Never again will my people be ashamed. And that's what we were talking about earlier. They were in their praying, in their repentance, they're saying, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? God says twice over here, never again will they ever say, where is your God? Because look, look at your wine, look at your olives, look at your animals, look at your green fields. They'll never come and say, well, where is your God? Because he says it's going to be obvious, and he's talking about material blessings. And they were saying, when people come into our land and see the devastation, they're going to say, well, where is your God? And that's really an important issue to God, especially if it involves the rulers and authorities being used to destroy his land because his people have been unfaithful. They, they, again, whatever they think they are doing in, a, in an attempt to destroy God's people, God is going to use it for good, just like we talked about last night. They're just moving the, the, the ball closer to the goal. The people are in rebellion. God allows them to be destroyed. They repent. They come to God. God redeems them and then drives the enemy out of the land and restores the land. And they may have thought, just like Jesus dying on the cross, you know, if God is on his side, why doesn't he come deliver him? Let's wait and see what God does. And Jesus died. They think, well, it looks like he wasn't, God wasn't on his side. And three days later, Jesus is resurrected. And it's very clear God was on his side, but in the end, their confusion in trying to destroy Jesus, they actually brought the redemption of all the people of God. So that is what's taking place in those verses. Again, two oracles, chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. He's going to restore the land. Then the people being told, the animals in the land being told, do not fear, rejoice, be glad. 
and then the second oracle of uh, again promise of restoration. Um, if you look on page one of the notes, um, I, I've got just an overview of chapter two verses twenty one through twenty three, and that's the the uh, uh, the song of praise. In fact, I write. Here is a prophetic song of joy given by the Lord through the prophet at this time to encourage the people. In other words, Joel may have even sung this part. You have the oracle that he's going to restore the land and drive out the northerner. And now you've got verse 21, 22, 23 of do not be afraid, be glad, start rejoicing. And then he goes back to some more material blessings. And here's what's happening in here in those three verses. This is addressed to the land, the beast, and the children of Zion. And again, it's in reverse order of chapter 1, verse 2 through 15, and 16 through 20, where the people were destroyed, the animals were devastated, and the land was devastated. The animals, the people had nothing. They couldn't even go and worship God because they didn't even have uh, grain to bring grain offerings. They had nothing to bring to the temple. Temple worship was shut down. They were starving. Then the animals were just wandering around trying to find pasture. There was nothing to eat. So the animals were suffering. And then the land, it says, after the locusts had eaten the bark off the trees, just wave after wave of locusts, the land itself started burning. Just fires were breaking out because it's so dry and there's a famine. Well, now this is a total reversal of that. And point two, they are told these three things. They are told, fear not, be glad, and rejoice. And all three of these are indications of salvation. When God says, fear not, that is uh, an indication that something you don't need to fear because I've got deliverance either manifesting or it is going to manifest. Fear not. And in this case, it sounds like this, this salvation or this deliverance has already come. So, so do not fear. Do not fear. You, you're being delivered. And because you've been delivered, because salvation has come, you should be glad and you should rejoice. So throughout these verses, the animals, the land, the people are told, fear not, be glad, rejoice. And the reason for that is God has worked his salvation. And I think, again, in Joel's day, it was going to manifest historically. But he's looking at the big picture of the total deliverance of God's plan of salvation having progressed and, and reached its fulfillment, of which we are in the midst of right now. And then point three, the reason for this is the great things or marvelous things done by Yahweh. And if you turn the page to page two, you can see in on page two in the Greek, Hebrew text, I've got in that box the word higdil is the Hebrew word. And it is, the, it is the same exact word when it talks about the northerner being destroyed because he had done higdil things. He had done great things, uh, but they were, and it's, there's great, and his nature was wicked, so they were greatly wicked things. But it's the same word here that God, in the very next verse, he has done great things. Just like the northerner had did great or higdil things, the Lord has done great big deal things, but what they're not evil things, they're great things. The northerner had done great than wicked things. The Lord has done great righteous things called marvelous. And so it says, uh, these are the reasons for, going back to page one, the reasons for the great things or the marvelous things done by Yahweh and these things that he's done that are great, they're listed right here. What are the great things he's done? They're very in this verse, very material. He has given them green pastures. He has put fruit on the trees and the vines have regrown and there is abundant rain. So it's raining, the fields are green, there's fruit on the trees, there's fruit on the vine. These are the pigdell things God has done. The locusts and the northerner have done great things but they destroyed all this and if you go back and read it, God led them in. God led the locusts in. God led the northerner in to destroy the land. And he did the great things of evil. Now God is reversing that and is doing the great things. Uh, all of these is a, a, a complete reversal of chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. We could read that. Uh, these blessings not only indicate material restoration, 
but the restoration of fellowship with Yahweh. Now I've turned the page on page two. And here we've got these three verses in the English Standard Version. And I'll read them again in the English Standard Version. The first, verse 21, is the land. Verse 22 is the beast. Verse 23 is the children of Zion. And it says, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. And it is not unusual for God to speak to the land. Uh, he, he talks about creation groaning, as in the, in the pains of childbirth in Romans. Uh, he, he speaks to the earth and it's, it's created and it's formed. Now he's speaking to the land, the land. You be glad, you rejoice because why? Well, because the people have repented. They've come back to me and we are in harmony and salvation has come. So be glad. And indeed, you've got examples of the, the creation rejoicing in, in, throughout the prophets. And in Romans, Romans 8, creation is longing. It gives the impression that creation is waiting, that has a personality in a sense uh, of, of waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. I'm not giving it a divine status, but that it is, it is responding to God's salvation. Chapter 2, verse 22, the animals. Fear not, again, there's the command. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, it's okay, it's a command. Fear not. This is, we're in salvation. Stop fearing. Fear not. You beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. Well, because of verse 21, God's restored the land. Now the animals, well look, the pastures are green again. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. And once again, worth mentioning, this wasn't an, an overnight, it, it could naturally, it could not have been an overnight experience. One day there's locusts and famine, and they get up the next morning after they prayed, Oh, look, the trees are blooming. I mean, if it's going to happen naturally, it's going to take several years for these trees to grow and everything to recover. And so they're, they're, you'd have to imagine at least naturally a, a period of time taking place here as the land's recovering. But again, you can see it, the trees, the, the vines, uh, and, and that's, that would be a process. Um, then finally, Joel 2, verse 23, Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Now I want to point out the emphasis here of phrases like, Your God. And it's going to come up, continue. Because now that they're no longer His enemy, they're no longer in opposition, but He's now come back into their camp. He's their God, they're His people, and He's working with them, He's living with them. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, or Yahweh your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. Meaning they repented, and now they've been vindicated. They've been restored. They, they've suffered his anger, and now they're enjoying his blessing because they've come back to him. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and latter rain, as before, as he originally had done. Now it's worth noting right here, uh, it, it's very clear this is talking about material blessing. I've said it several times. This verse, as it says in the NIV and the English Standard, I'm going to mention something that I just want to mention it because it's hanging there so you know that it's in this verse, but the, it, it, there's really no indication that that's what you should be seeing in this verse. But yet it is in that verse and if you look at it from another angle, it's like, wait, this may be a big, big deal. So I don't know. It's one of those things where I, I don't, this is very clearly talking about material blessings. We're clearly talking about the land, the animals, the rain coming and producing. And we got crops again. We're eating, we're drinking wine, we're eating figs. Everything's good. But within there, well, here it is. And it's in your footnotes, probably in your Bibles. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain and the early and latter rain as before. Now if you look in the Hebrew text right there, and I'll read it backwards there starting on the top. Then you children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for He has given you, and that next word is the word, uh, the former rain, but the word M O W R E H, 
M O R W E H, Mora. Uh, now, oh, excuse me. I reversed this. Can't even spell English. Why am I trying to spell Hebrew? Is that right? Mo Mora. Now, t turn the page for me. And right here is I cut and paste this off Bible Hub. There's the word Mora. It's the strong word 4175. Uh, the phonetic spelling is Mora. You can see that. It means rain. And you've got two definitions in the Brown and BDB, the Brown Driver Briggs. The noun in the masculine means early rain, as in Psalm 84 and Joel 2.23. Also, the masculine noun also means teacher. And that is right out of the Hebrew. It means teacher. And it's translated he teacher in these other places you can see right there. Now we go back to the Hebrew text. And the word that is, is tigdequa. Uh, there was that Liz, Liz the ka, ka, sorry, is faithfully in the, the translation here. Or he has in the English standard for he has given you the early rain for your vindication early rain would could be teacher or and then the the, the other word would be vindication or here faithfully so it's like is it is it vindication is it faithfully or it also means righteousness in fact that's the meaning it, the word is righteousness. So it is rain for your righteousness, or rain righteous. When you put this together, this says, I mean straight up in the Hebrew, it says teacher of righteousness. I will give you the teacher of righteousness uh, for the former and latter rain. So along with him sending material blessings like rain, grass, crops, trees, there's going to be a teacher of righteousness that's going to come, and that would be put in there. Now you understand how awkward that is because we're talking about crops, fields, animals, rain, then all of a sudden, teaching righteousness. That, that, so that's, that's why translations go the latter rains for your vindication or latter rains uh, because uh, of your, your righteousness. Because you're, you're back, I'm going to give you the latter rains. And that, that's fine. Except if you look in your Bibles, you probably have a footnote on there somewhere. Uh, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran community, there is this figure throughout their writings of the teacher of righteousness. And they, the idea is that before God's total... Ooh, I just erased a verse right there. I didn't want to erase. I was going to go there. With, right, I was going to go there and show that to you. That's Isaiah. I've got it. I've got it in my phone. I'll look at it here quick. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> You've been looking at it all night. Uh, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 30, verse 20. If you want to go there, you can. Isaiah 30, verse 20. And then and uh, through 23, and then Amos uh, chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. And again, this is I just want to sh show you this. The idea would be that, and Joel could be in a sense a, a figure of that. Is you're going to have to have, especially if you're a pagan culture, especially if you've gone the wrong way, you're going to have to have a teacher of God's Word, of righteousness, of the truth, to bring you back. And when you come back, you're going to get the rain. First of all, the man has to be restored, and then the creation is going to follow. So it's not odd to think, if you're going to have the physical material rain, you're going to have to have the, 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 the Word, the truth, explained to you. I mean, we can't expect... Our, for example, you can't expect our culture, the progressive culture that's going unraveling, 
to come to the modern Western church and hear more postmodernism and more unraveling of progressivism and say, oh, we found Jesus. No, you've just created a Jesus in your own image. Continue to unravel. Something's going to have to come in like the Word and penetrate the hearts of a culture and it's probably going to come through a teacher. God's not going to write it in the sky. It's going to come through a prophet. It's going to come through Jesus. It's going to come through an apostle. It's going to come from the written word, and it's going, or you know, however it's going to come, and it's going to enter the heart of a man, which is then going to change again their environment. Isaiah 30. I'm going to read that very quickly here. And this is, I don't want to spend much time on this. I just want this to be suggested because it's hanging right there. Isaiah 30, verse 20. And if you ever study this, it's going to pop up every once in a while. Isaiah 30, verse 20. Also, this book of Joel, if you've noticed, is very linked in with Deuteronomy. Because all the curses of the law are coming on the land when the people are restored all the blessings of Deuteronomy are coming on the land. And Deuteronomy was the teaching. It was the teaching. Moses taught that, that second generation. And he taught them this is the curses, these are the blessings, and that was the information. So within this book of Joel is the teaching of Deuteronomy, and the teaching is you follow the ways of the Lord that were given to you, and these blessings will come. You reject the teaching the Lord gave you, these curses are going to come. So to have the teacher of righteousness smack dab in the middle, it's only mentioned once, if it is mentioned at all, but it's smack dab in the middle, the teacher of the righteousness is there. Well, here's, here's Isaiah 30, verse 20. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity, and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now people want to spiritualize that because you're singing goofy songs in church about your boyfriend Jesus that you're going to hear a voice and tell you what to do. It's like, no, that, that, that could be the Spirit, but most likely in a postmodern generation that mixes up secular and with, with the holy, you're going to need someone that's going to come in and teach you the Word of God so that you can reformat your mind. You're going to have to unplug and reset your mind with the Word of God. And then you'll be able to hear a voice. You'll have some kind of recollection saying, this is the way, walk in it. Then, you'll, uh, you, then you will defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. Now, if you are in a progressive culture and you're going to renew your mind, it's ridiculous to think that you're going to come into a progressive church and sing worldly sounding songs with worldly lyrics and renew your mind and then go, aha, this progressive ideology is trash. I'm going to throw it away, uh, as described here. You're going to have to have, from this worldview, you're going to have to have something completely opposite show you the right way. You're going to have to renew your mind and stop conforming into the world. And so that's Isaiah saying the same thing. That you're going to have to have a teacher. You're going to have someone's going to have to come. And we would like to think the Spirit of God is involved in this, which the Spirit of God is. But if you are void of the Spirit of God and are completely consumed by the Spirit of the world, you're going to have to have someone, something explain to you reality. Now, go to Amos, Amos chapter 8. And here's a, a great verse, just like we saw a, a famine a famine here in chapter 1 and I'm going to read this and, and get off of this subject here and we've read this verse before uh, remember there was a famine in the land the locusts came there was a famine in Joel's day the land was even on fire because of the devastation the Lord had brought so he brought in a famine it says I will bring my locusts his army Verse 11 of chapter 8 of Amos, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. 
Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. It sounds like Proverbs. In your day of disaster, you've rejected me, rejected me. Now in the day of disaster, you cry out for me, but I won't answer. I'm going to shut off my word. When you get so far down the progressive trail and you're so confused and everything's unraveled, it's like, we need truth. God says, not now. Not now, it's too late. I'm going to send you a famine of truth on your land so you just continue down this path of progressivism and destroy yourself. And that's right there. So there's within the Word of God the connection of rain, and we can find other places. The Word is the rain for your soul, just like the rain is the rain for the soil to produce crops. So it's not that far-fetched to see that teacher of righteousness, because it's in the Hebrew, uh, but again, you're interrupting the flow of the theme. You see what I'm saying? The theme is the restoration of the land, the rain, that all of a sudden teach of righteousness. But yet at the same time, throughout the Bible, rain and the word are connected. Okay, that's what I wanted to say there. Uh, we are going over to chapter, or page three. I'm going to look at my clock. And now we come into the last part right here, the second prophecy or oracle, verse 24 through 27. And this again, a, a restatement, almost in a, like a parallel. You had the, the first oracle before the three verses of Do Not Be Afraid, the song. You're going to now repeat it. And here's, here's what it says. I'm reading in the, the notes in the English Standard. It, I've got written here, the second prophecy or oracle promising restoration. This is a continued reversal of the locust, the famine, the fire, and the invading army. So everything that was done wrong to the land is now being reversed. Joel 2.24 The threshing floors will be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I've got it written there. It's contrasting with chapter 1, verse 10 and 12 and verse 17. You go back and read that. I'll restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I send among you. And again, we talked about those four phases of the locust. And again, it's worth considering, are they different types of locusts? Are they different stages of growth of locusts? Or is it merely a parallelism, uh, parallel, how do you say that? It's just, you know, this repeating the same thing four times. It's just waves of locusts, meaning totality of destruction. Well now, everything that those four waves have done, God is going to undo. And again, don't miss the fact right there that he admits, he claims, and it's the second time, I sent them. I sent this to you. And then on page four, uh, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. Uh, and in verse 26 and 27, the next verse 27, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God or I am Yahweh your God and there is none, uh, none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Now in verse 26 and 27, I've got it written there between those in the notes, point one, there's repeated reference of Israel as God's people. I mean, this is God is back with his people. And, he, and they're not, they're not, they're not in a sense here sinners. They're people that have been delivered. They're people that have been saved. I, I think we're talking, if it's eschatological, we're talking about a people with a new heart. They've been made into the image of God. Uh, anyway, he says right here, A, they will they praise the name of the Lord our God. My people shall never again be put to shame. You know, my people, it says that twice. Know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God. Five times, two times, you know, the same statement. Five times, in those two verses, five times God says very clearly, me and my people are now united, and there's nothing that's going to break that bond. And again, that, has, that obviously would refer to in Joel's day of them coming back, but this has, again, that that overtone of completeness, finality. Uh, and again, that's I, I said it earlier in the night, point two, in Joel 2, 17, the people had lamented, why should they say among the peoples, or the Gentiles, the nations, where is their God? But now the Lord is with his people, and he says, they will never ask that question again, because look at what you've got. Look at what I'm doing. Uh, and that ends... 
that part right there, but it doesn't end chapter 2 because beginning in verse 28, we now read these verses and this becomes the supernatural spiritual side, which is clearly eschatological. And we're going to have to now read this next week and put it together and I'll read it now. And afterward, he says, the next verse, I mean, we just talked about material manifestation of the blessings of the restored people because they repented. And then it says, and afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And in those days, it is a clear reference to eschatological future days. This is not going to happen in Joel's day, but in those days, this is yet to look forward to. So you could see the material blessing taking place, you know, 560 BC. But with that was a promise of there's something greater going to happen besides the harvest. We're going to have something bigger take place, which may connect with the earlier verses in the book. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that is an interesting verse. We'll talk about it and I've thought about it many times. Is right there on the great and dreadful day as Jesus is returning or upon his return in those final days. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This leads to that question you asked Marilyn a couple weeks ago. What about the 666? It says anyone who receives the mark of the beast, they're never going to be saved. But then it's like, what, what does that mean? I mean, I, again, how far do you push? I mean, does that mean that once you get the mark, you're done? And yes, that's what it says. But yet here in this verse, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved in that great day. So leading up to the very moments before, there will be people in the state of being undecided or being confused or deceived. And as things transpire, even the final moments, they're calling on the name of the Lord. There is salvation, I think. Oh, right here, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's throughout history, but the context is those final moments of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. When you see these things unwrapping and you realize your progressive schedule is not working out, uh, and then what do you do with those with the mark of the beast? It's like, is there is there a chance for me? They're not like in hell. It's not like they died. Again, I don't want to open. I don't want to see something heretical. Uh, but it's like, what what does that mean? Anyway. Uh, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And we'll talk, talk about that. And that's clearly eschatological, but we're moving from the material blessing of the restoration of the land to uh, the restoration of the human soul, because the Spirit is coming into the human soul and the sons and daughters, and everyone has got the Spirit. In the Old Testament, as you know, the spirit, the, the prophets had the Spirit, or the kings had the Spirit, or the priests had the Spirit, but not everyone. That's why they followed this leadership. But when this total salvation manifests, it's everyone's going to have that Spirit resting on them, not just for a, an office, but for a personal relationship with God. And that's, again, some interesting verses, especially since Peter quotes them uh, on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection as the church age begins. Which would mean, he even, as you know, he says, they're wondering what was going on on that day of Pentecost in 30 AD. He says, this is, these are the days that Joel spoke about. This is what Joel said. We are seeing what Joel talked about. And yet that was 2,000 years ago, so it, it's almost like in we're in that transition. It was beginning there and still growing and manifesting. We'll talk about that more. I'll pray and we are finished. I do appreciate you being here. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We ask that we may understand them. And Father, we do ask that we would handle them correctly, that you would take any errors or deviations and bring us into the truth, that we may walk in your path, that we may have an understanding that is a light for our path, that we may indeed be able to share it with other people and live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, thank you for being here.